Hello everyone, my name is Tulio Pascual. I'm from the Critics Group at the University of Luxembourg, and today I'm going to talk about our most recent work called DIPS, Dynamic, Private, and Secure GWAS. Let us start with a brief genomic background. So, the human DNA consists of nucleotides that contains our genetic information. Those nucleotides are represented by letters such as A, D, C, and G. However, at some specific positions of our DNA, the humans share different genetic information. In those positions are called by single nucleotide polymorphism or SNPs. In the SNPs, we can find two types of allels. We have major allels that are the most common allel in a population and they are represented by zeros. And we have the minor allels that are the less common allel in a population and they are represented by ones. On the right side, we have the digital representation of the human DNA. We have the, in the columns, we have the SNP IDs to identify the positions, and we have the sequences of the alleles of each individual. But why is genomic data is important? Because we can use genomic data to conduct genome-wide association studies. The main goal of GWAS is to find SNPs that are statistically associated with a phenotype, for example, a disease. The first step of GWS is to collect genomic data from two different populations. The case population, that are the people that express the phenotype, for example, people that have diabetes, and the control population that are the health people. And then we process that data by computing statistics over it. And finally, we release uh, GWS results, and we have two types of GWS results. We release aggregate statistics such as minor allele frequencies and pairwise allele frequencies. And we can also release test statistics such as linkage disequilibrium between SNPs, p values, r squares, and c squares to show how strong is the correlation between a SNP and a phenotype. And now we are moving towards a federated GWS setting where we consider data from multiple sources instead of only one. And as a result, we would be able to produce more accurate and to find better statistical findings from the results. However, as we are managing a very sensitive data, we need to enforce secure and privacy preserved processing and also to enforce privacy preserving release. Let's see into more details what are the main challenges. So the first challenge is how to secure and privacy preserving process the genomic data. In the, in the literature, we have some approaches that would enforce such properties. We can use secure multi-party computation protocols. We could use a of encryption, differential privacy, or rely on trusted execution environment. We have choose to use TEs because it shows a better trade-off when compared to the uh, approach in the literature. The second challenge is on the data release of GWS. It has to be in a privacy preserving manner. It has been shown in the literature that the simple release of GWS results are vulnerable to recovery and membership attacks. And since 2018, the GWS results are not made public anymore. In addition, these attacks can be facil facilitated by collusion among participants. Now let's see in more details uh, the privacy attacks on GWS releases. We have the recovery attack where the Federation gathers encrypted genomic data and processes it in a secure manner. And then it finally releases the, the statistical results. However, in a recovery attack, the adversary can observe the, the statistics and might be able to compute uh, many possibilities for the sequences of the genome types of the individuals and might be able to find the correct sequences. And then uh, identifying and inferring with success the genotype sequences of people that have participated in a study. On the other hand, in a membership attack, we follow the same pip pipeline as introduced before, but now we assume that the adversary has access to the genotype of the victim in addition to the results of the study. And then he might be able to run some statistical tests in order to find if the genotype of the victim participated in a study. In the literature, there are some approaches that forces safe releases of GWS, and we can categorize them into three types. Some of them are based on defining thresholds to afford correct inferences from polynomial probabilistic time adversaries. We can also rely on statistical tests, such as likelihood rate tests, 
to enforce that no individual can be identified as a participant in a study. In addition, we can also use differential bias to protect the outputs of the releases by applying noise and make sure that the membership attack cannot be successful. We built our mechanism from a paper published in Yazorix 2011. And in this table, we summarize the main, uh, what are the safe conditions for GWS releases. Through, to protect tests and aggregate statistics against recovery attack, we need to make sure that we are using enough genomes. The same thing for protecting test is statistics results from membership attacks. However, to protect aggregate statistics from membership attacks, we rely on likelihood rate tests to enforce that no one can be identified. However, in practical settings, genomes can be added or, or removed over time, and therefore we cannot use the state of their solutions because they assume a static settings. For an example, in this illustration, we show how an adversary can combine different releases from one study and observe how the statistics have evolved and then take advantage of this fact and being able to circumvent these solutions. In this slide, I will summarize the problem, motivation, and our contribution themes. So during the data collection step, we need secure sharing of genomic data. And for that, DIPS uses only encrypted and silent data. In the data processing, we need privacy preserving and efficient processing. And for that, DIPS relies on trusted execution environments to decrypt and process the data. On the data release step of the problem, we need to enforce privacy preserving releases considering dynamic settings and also able to cope with collusion attacks. And for that, DIPS offers a dynamic and collusion resident algorithms. Now let's discuss in more detail the system and threat models of DIPS. So we assume a federation with B biocenters where uh, F strictly smaller than B biocenters might collude to attack the final results. In addition, each biocenter sequences new, new people at a different pace. However, before sharing their genomic data, they will encrypt and sign the data before sending it to the, to the enclave. In the enclave, the data is securely stored and it's decrypted only in the trusted area where DIP runs its protocol and defines a safe batch of requests to be used. Now let's see the workflow of our approach. So we have uh, two FIFO queues, one for addition and another for removals, and the genome operations are treated in a FIFO order. Next, we run our cell request selection mechanism to find a safe batch of genome operations that will be used to compute the GWAS. In the third step, we process the aggregate the test statistics data over the, the SNPs of the study using the selected genomes in the previous step. And finally, in the fourth step, we need to run the membership test to find which subset of SNPs can also release aggregate statistics. Now let's see uh, how our uh, solution works. So there is a static release condition in the state of the art that's defined by this equation. So we know the number of SNPs of a study that is represented by L, and using this equation, we can find how many genomes we will need to protect a release, that is, in this case, N. In the, in, on the right side, we have an example. So we want that to start L SNPs, and we have uh, gathered N1 genomes that satisfy the conditions of this, of this equation. However, the state of that do not assume that the adversaries can combine releases. And by observing multiple releases, the adversary now is able to circumvent uh, these uh, boundaries of the, this equation. However, in our paper, we show that following simple uh, properties, uh, we can make sure that we have always safe releases, even if they are combined. In addition, we don't need to use a brute force approach to combine every existing release. So these properties are, we make sure that when select a safe batch of requests, we have more additions than removals. And in addition, the number of additions operations and remove operations is bigger than the l 2 n function. In addition, we also assume that any subset of biocenters uh, will be vulnerable to, to the collusion between others. As I said, we make sure that 
every subset of bar centers, they have enough operations that will uh, protect them against the colluding ones. We also offered a dynamic scaling mechanism to help in having sooner releases of GWS. What's the idea here? If we want to restore the very huge uh, GWS that has a big number of L, we would need to guard a million and million genomes before being able to find a safe release. However, what we can do is to consider a smaller subset of these NIPs instead of the full set. And then it, finding uh, releases will be easier and faster. In this example here, we decreased the number of SNPs and we found uh, a safe release in use in one genomes. We also showed that we can increase the number of SNPs being considered in the study by depending on how many genomes have been gathered at the later point. In this release number three, it's a standard release, it's a vertical release, where we, we keep the number of SNPs and we guard the sufficient number of genome operations. On the other hand, we also show that if this number, if the current number of genomes is already big enough, we can increase the number of SNPs that we will have statistics released in a safe manner. Now I will explain how we adapted the state of the art solution to protect releases against membership tests. So first of all, we use a secure genome that's a tool to identify which SNPs can be safely released uh, so that no individual can be identified as a participant in a study. And it uses a likelihood rate of test mechanism. However, as we are assuming dynamic releases, we need to make sure that when releases are combined, the same SNPs are being released as well. For, for example, here we had the first release and we selected the, the three SNPs, ID 1, 2, and 3, to have an uh, aggregate statistic release. However, in the second release, we found that ID 1 and that ID 2 were safe for aggregate statistics. However, we need to combine both releases, and release 1 and release 2, and make sure that ID 1 was also, is also safe when combined it with the previous release. And that's the case for ID1. However, for ID2, when we combine those releases, we identify that ID2 is not safe, and therefore we cannot release ID2 in this time. And then our third example, where we had a third release, and we identify which SNPs can be released. And again, we need to make sure that when we combine previous releases, the same IDs are found as well. And this is the case for the one. It was found safe in when the combinations were evaluated. As uh, ID3 did succeed in the evaluation, we cannot release data over SNP ID3. And ID4 was never released before, so we can proceed with the aggregate statistics releases over ID4 as well. Now let's talk about the performance evaluation of our solution. So we use the Graphene SGX to implement our protocol inside the SGX enclave. And we use the AES 256-bit encryption with ECDSA signature scheme. We assume the different values for following a Poisson distribution for generating genome requests from the biocenters. And we consider a variety of GWS scenarios. We use it uh, simulated genomes up to 6 million and also real genomes on the experiments. Uh, for the real genome datasets, we use the I-1 with uh, 2,000 uh, genomes, and also the dbgap dataset with approximately 28,000 genomes. And we evaluated many metrics in, of our approach, such as the complexity and CPU runtime of our algorithm, and the bandwidth, memory consumption, purpose risk, and then purpose again, releases performance, and scalability. The first result is on the complexity and CPU runtime of our approach. As I explained before, we don't need a brute force approach to combine existing releases. We only need to, 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 to make sure that we are selecting a safe batch of requests that follows the, the conditions I presented before. And then we, our algorithm has constant time. Otherwise, if we would use a brute force approach, it, uh, the complexity of the brute force approach increases exponentially as expected. Because as many rounds we have, we need to check more releases. And some numbers now for the bandwidth. Uh, so we counted genomes uh, 
SNPs with uh, two bits for to represent each SNP. So we we have a total of 75 kilobytes for a 300k uh, SNPs study, and the overall re request size is 258 bits and approximately 48 bytes after the encryption. So we have a shorter response and release construction time. And, and one important result here is the average consumption that deploys two megabytes, and uh, it's within the memory limitations of FGX. In this slide, uh, we compare, I show the results on the comparison of our approach to a naive dynamic approach. This naive dynamic approach does not consider that genomes and releases can be combined. And using this approach, we we would uh, have, we would find five up to five percent of the releases could contain uh, genomes at risk. However, as they don't uh, they don't assume a safe selection of requests, they are able to have more releases and also to consider more genome operations. And then, but the problem again is that up to eight percent of the genomes could be exposed to privacy attacks. If we use DIPs, we release less frequently, but we are protecting the genomic privacy. This slide that will present the impact of colluding biocenters. Uh, this chart is showing the delays, the operational delays for additions, but the, both for additions and removals, we have a similar behavior. And as expected, as we increase the number of colluding biocenters in the Federation, it's more difficult to find a safe batch of requests. We also compare DIPS to a static LR approach to protect the releases against membership attacks. And as you can see, DIPS is able to release since the beginning of the experiment. On the other hand, the static LR approach can only release at the end of the experiment when they have gathered the, all of the genomes. In addition, DIPS does not degrade the number of SNPs, and even at some, some rounds, DIPS was able to consider more SNPs than the static approach. We also evaluated DIPs on the uh, larger scale GDB setting with 5,000 SNPs positions from five biocenters, and we used the DIP gap data set with approximately 28,000 genomes. And as you can see in the chart, uh, DIPs has reasonable response time, and the most expensive step is the SNP selection algorithm, where we need to combine and collect genomes from different uh, releases to compute the LR statistics. And now the conclusions of our work. So we have offered here the first solution that combines fully privacy preserving GWS in terms of sharing, processing, and releasing. And we also consider dynamic and resilient to collusion GWS. As a future work, we plan to treat malicious biocenters threat model where we can cope with uh, malicious requests from the biocenters. In addition, we plan to offer a data oblivious version of our protocol in order to cope with cyber chain attacks against SGX. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation.